The Tory party is in conflict with itself. The complete ineptitude of Kwarteng and Truss uh, thinking that they could simply have the sort of cargo cult Thatcherite, you know, uh, just cut taxes and you get growth automatically as if it's sort of alchemy without explaining to anyone where the growth was going to come for, from, what sectors are you talking about? Any of these questions at all, they were just too arrogant to answer. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, William Clouston. William, welcome to the show. Thanks for the invitation, Brendan. Good to be here. And uh, I, the reason I wanted you on this week is because British politics has gone insane, and I thought we we need one of the saner voices from British politics to come on and talk about it all. So obviously I thought of you. Uh, many listeners will know that you are the leader of the Social Democratic Party, that you've been making the case for a very long time for a shake-up of the two-party system and for a better politics that is more representative of, of what people need and what people want. So we'll get into all of that a little later, but let's kick off by just talking about what the hell is going on? So the week in which we are speaking has been an incredibly eventful week. And Liz Truss is in office, but not necessarily in charge. We've got a new chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, who seems to be running the show. And there's a lot of confusion as to who really is running the country and who really is the prime minister. What is your sense about where power lies at the moment and, and what it might tell us about the state of Britain after 12 years of Tory rule? The Tory party is in conflict with itself. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. But um, Truss obviously won the election and she's given her brand of politics a role. Um, it's been found wanting Ironically, actually, Brendan, you know, market purists have been found out by the market. I mean, the, yeah. the, scariest, the scariest thing that's happened is the uh, is the ten year yield chart. I mean, that's the thing. It's a little bit boring, but the thing is, if you have a, an investor strike and you're borrowing so much money, you're in real trouble. I mean, I'm not joking. You're you're heading towards Argentina. You know, you're 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 in real real trouble if that happens. So um, the complete ineptitude of Kwarteng and Truss uh, thinking that they could simply have the sort of cargo cult Thatcherite, you know, uh, just cut taxes and you get growth automatically as if it's sort of alchemy without explaining mm -hmm. to anyone where the growth was going to come for, from, what sectors are you talking about, how long is it going to take, how are you going to... You know, if you're going to cut taxes, how are you going to reduce the public sector borrowing requirement? Any of these questions at all, they thought they were just too arrogant to answer. So my take on it is that a slightly sort of childish econ-liberal clique has been found out and turfed out. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people are saying they don't like, you know, the, the orthodoxy taking control again. But, you know, what, I would say, what, what was the alternative? I mean, what were they going to do? Um, it's not democratic, of course, because they mm. put themselves in a terrible position. But uh, although they, you know, individuals have changed, it's equivalent to sort of the IMF bailout, you know, with Healy. Um, I think that actually, I think Healy's government, I think the Callaghan government's an underrated government, actually. But you know, it's it's going to go down in history. This. Yeah. So we'll get into Hunt in a minute. Um, but firstly, just to stick with Trust Quateng and their incredibly short-lived economic experiment, um, I want to ask you about that because it does strike me that you're, you're absolutely right. Liz Truss won the uh, Conservative Party uh, leadership contest which means that she is legitimately the leader of the party and the leader of the country. Um, but hasn't there been a a big break with the democratic mandate of December 2019, which was obviously given to Boris Johnson. Huge, vast swathes of people, including many working class voters who traditionally would have voted for the Labour Party, voted for Boris Johnson's Conservatives for a number of reasons. Firstly, to get Brexit over the line, also because of ideas like levelling up and having a bit more state uh, support for communities that felt they had been left behind and basically trying to make the country a little bit more equal. It certainly wasn't a free market agenda that people uh, lined up behind Boris for. So when Truss and Kwarteng took over and quite quickly instituted these fairly radical measures, wasn't that a break from what people voted for? And does that make it problematic? 
I think I, I'd agree with you. I think it was certainly a break uh, with the 2019 general election coalition, and it was arguably a break from the Brexit vote itself. Mm. But I, I think there's a call for a little bit of honesty, Brendan, about this stuff. What we've got to be honest about is that the Brexit coalition itself was a coalition between two wildly different yeah. visions of what we wanted a, a sort of you know nation state to be. Now, the, the, I have to say I was on the minority of that. There's about five or six million of us on the left that voted for it for essentially more protection and democracy. Uh, so you, you might say Benite reasons. Some of us might say Shoreite reasons. You might want to reindustrialize. You might even, heaven forbid, want some protectionism. That's what we voted for. But the, the majority, certainly of the leadership of both major leave campaigns, were econ liberal free traders. And their best idea, that, Brendan, they only had one idea. And mm. the idea was unilateral free trade. Now, the problem with that is, and they've got to face it, if you have that, China will eat your lunch and you'll become a tourist destination. <laughs> that's that's basically what, what's happened. Now, I I think free trade has been disastrous for Cleveland, Ohio, and Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh, and Middlesbrough, and Birmingham. I think it's been utterly disastrous. So we were arguing for something rather different, and all the press were going on. You know, you're not going to get a free free trade deal. I never wanted one. Mm-hmm. Paddy O'Flynn and I. I was. I remember chatting to Paddy about it in 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 2018, 2019. We the SDP were getting a little bit of cut through, and I I, I say, are you okay with me actually arguing on the radio? or on TV openly that I don't want to deal with the EU because the EU was and is really, in a sense, our, our most problematic trade partner. We have a £80 billion pound, uh, bilateral trade deficit. And it's, it, if you run these trade deficits, eventually you just get poorer, you just impoverish yourself. So, And he was fine with that, and that's been our position. But our, our position's a minority position, Brendan. Most people were rushing around saying, if you don't get a trade deal, you'll be finished. So uh, my reading of this is that what you're seeing now is a is a sort of colossal uh, impact with reality of just the incompatibility of the Brexit coalition itself. And yes, you know Johnson sort of papered over the cracks a wee bit in 2019, but getting the, those red wall seats. But the Tories sort of inherited them without really wanting them or understanding them. I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point about the unstable nature of the Brexit coalition to begin with. And uh, obviously, the very fact that 17.4 million people, for whatever reason, voted for Brexit meant that it was incredibly important in order to save democracy that Brexit happened. But it's a useful reminder, I think, that Brexit, for many of us, was in some ways a starting point of a new politics rather than the end point. So the fact that there were differing views behind why people voted for Brexit wasn't necessarily a problem because if we left the European Union, we would have more sovereign control, more democratic choice, and then we could have those kinds of discussions about where the the nation might need to go next. Uh, And I think it's, it's really true about the Brexit coalition because I would meet you know, right wing journalists in London, for example, who would talk about, you know, ideas to do with Singapore on the Thames and really ratcheting up Thatcherite policies now that we're free of the European bureaucracy. And then you'd go around the country and meet people who didn't have those ideas at all. And for whom Brexit meant having a bit more control over their communities, over their lives, a bit more self-respect and democratic clout in the political process. So hugely different views. But I wonder, given the ascendancy of Trust Quarteng, however short-lived it was, and given that it's now been replaced by I don't know what we're going to call it, Jeremy Huntism, you know, Hunt in charge of the country uh, as the chancellor. And he's obviously notoriously a Remainer, very, very anti-Brexit. Is the Brexit cause a lost cause because the political establishment have pushed it in a particular direction or tried to thwart it or don't have sufficient respect for it? How much do you think the events of the past few weeks suggest that Brexit might be in a bit of trouble more broadly as an idea? It's possible that it could be, and I think we need to be aware of that. We need to be vigilant about that. I think there are a lot of, obviously, the political establishment, the cultural establishment would like nothing more mm. uh, than for us to fail and have to go creeping back and, and get back in. But, you know, there actually there are, that's, that's, I don't know that that necessarily happens. I think there's a lot of uh, hurdles to get this country back in. It would be really quite difficult. Although, again, people keep on tweeting 
uh, polling that shows that, uh, you know, 60% of people would want to rejoin. I mean, I think largely a lot of that is just completely wrong. Uh, you're right to say that a lot of the journalists and a lot of the commentators, I think the level of debate was atrocious. The people on the right, uh, the econ right, that say they wanted Singapore on Thames knew virtually nothing about Singapore at all. <laughs> I mean, I would say uh, it's astonishing. I mean, my family's had a, a link to Singapore from, and continues to have a link through family in, in, in Singapore now, you know, for, since the 70s. And I, if you say, we'll have a bit of Singapore on Thames, well, what, yes, their public transport is fantastic. Mm -hmm. State intervention is high uh, in the housing market, and they know what an industrial policy is. So a lot of that was just, uh, frankly, ignorance. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing, I think, is that there's some, to some extent, the sort of liberal econ vision of Brexit is being found out. It was never, never made any sense. And, um, you know, I, I just, I think it's going to be very, very hard to argue. I mean, tr also, trussonomics, whatever you want to call it, commands such a low percentage of, of popular opinion. The num I mean, Matt Goodwin reckons that the number of people that support both cutting taxes and uh, cutting spending is about 7% of the public. Well, best of luck with that. Spiked is free and it always will be. There's no paywall and no subscriptions. We want to reach as many people as possible. But to do that, we need your help. If you support the work that we do, why not become a regular donor? As little as £5 a month is enough to make a huge difference. Whatever you can give is greatly appreciated, especially with all that's going on in the world at the moment. If you want to make a regular donation, then all you have to do is go to spiked-online.com and hit the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spiked-online.com and the red donate button in the top right corner. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, Hunt, the our new chancellor, who has done something quite extraordinary, which is he's taken office in number 11 and his first act was basically to overthrow uh, a huge amount of the economic policies put forward by Liz Truss, his neighbour and the leader of the country. Um, so these are extraordinary events and, and you say that there was not very much choice uh, for the party but to do something like that. That may be true but is, isn't it the case that having someone like Jeremy Hunt essentially, essentially uh, determining the policies of the nation and the future of the nation, at least in the short term, there's something quite problematic about that, isn't there? Because he is not popular with Conservative Party uh, members, particularly. He has not won a leadership contest in the past. He's not particularly popular in the country at large, I would imagine. He was on the wrong side of the Brexit discussion to, to the extent of, of pushing for some form of second referendum, which of course would have meant voiding the votes of millions of people. And now he is, according to many observers, a de facto prime minister, the, the leader of the country. Uh, and it does have a coup-like feel to it, doesn't it? And, and the immediate question it raises in my mind is, don't we need an injection of the wisdom of the masses in all of this, in, in, the, in the shape of a general election? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's true. I think it, it very much has the sort of whiff of a, a sort of Maria Monti or Maria Draghi uh, sense mm. to it, you know. I mean, it's it is a sort yeah. of. A, I, I I can see Pete the narrative of an establishment takeover, and also I I also take the point about the you know um, interference of organisations like the IMF lobbying openly lobbying uh, even even Biden open, mm. openly lobbying against the government, uh, and you know I, I think it has that stench about it. Um, and uh, should we have a you know general election? Yes, we should. Obviously, we should, but we won't in my opinion, get one, because literally in the space of a day, Hunt has calmed the markets. You know, 10-year yield curve has fallen, and, um, you know, the pound was up to 213 against the dollar. So anyway, in the very short term, he's calmed it down, and that's what they wanted him to do. Um, I mean, I know a number of people who know Redwall Tory MPs very well. One of my friends works for, for one, and the point he said to me, Brendan, was that, you know, a lot of these red wall Tory MPs are on very slim majorities, you know, 500 or 1,000 mm. votes. A lot of them didn't expect to win in 2019. And for a lot of them, and this is a key point, it's not a democratic point, but it's a key point, a lot of them are earning more money now than they've ever earned. They, you know, they, they, they have a salary, often their wives run their offices. 
if you're going to be a single term Tory MP, why would you be a three year one instead of a five year one? Yeah. That, I'm, I'm sure that that is the calculation a lot of those MPs are, are making. And I think, uh, sadly, I think you're right. I think the prospect of a general election anytime soon is is a distant one. So uh, I think that's a bit of a shame. But I wanted to ask you about the markets and the role of the markets in all of this, because one thing that does concern me about this discussion in particular is that it has set a precedent that politics in this country should be shaped by what the markets need or expect. So obviously that has been some people's expectation for a very long time, but it's become quite explicit over the past few weeks that because Truss and Kwarteng spooked the markets, that was a problem. Because they spooked the IMF, that was a problem. And uh, we needed to pay attention to either these globalist institutions or the markets themselves and uh, amend our economic policies to make them fit better with what the markets were expecting and what would make the markets more healthy. Now, of course, many people would say that that was a realist policy, and that's what a government needs to do in order to keep things stable. But at the same time, doesn't it set a problematic precedent when you have people not only on the right and in the Bank of England and other expected quarters making that kind of argument, but also people on the left and the liberal left and even the radical left, some of whom foolishly, in my view, cheered on the IMF's intervention and also talked quite loudly about stupid trust spooking the markets. Isn't there a danger that elevating what the markets need over what the legitimate prime minister of the country wanted to do is itself an interference with political independence and possibly with democracy itself. Yeah, and no, I think you have some very good points there. I think there's a lot in that. But on the other hand, um, you know, the, 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 the markets are, you know, it's fear and greed, isn't it? And uh, when you get a, what, what is called a Minsky moment, you know, when a, a, a long-term curve changes and fear becomes rampant, mm. it's a very, very, very dangerous thing. And, you know, whatever you say about Kwarteng and Truss, they made it more expensive for households up and in the country to pay their mortgages mm. immediately. I mean, you know, if you put on half a percent on to uh, interest rates, you're, you're going to really screw things up for a lot of people. And so, uh, you know, these things do have uh, consequences and they needed, they were just very arrogant, very incompetent. I'm quite surprised Trust won this election. You know, in the Tory party, whatever you think of it, was she the best candidate? You, you couldn't come up with a better candidate than that. You, you didn't have anyone that was had the basic political skills. I mean, I'm not a brilliant speech giver. I much prefer questions and debates. But the Tory MPs, did they not take a look at her? I mean, Mm. she's not convincing at all. It's really quite bad. I've said more broadly that what I'm worried about, what I see in the West is is just decline, you know, moral decay and decline all over the place. And there are lots of events. You have this series of major events, the GFC, you know, failure to regulate the market properly, and then COVID and lockdowns, you know, terrible decisions on lockdowns. And then and then the energy crisis that we're living through now, you could also link it to things like the capital riot. You know, that that wouldn't have happened mm. in the 50s. You know, just these things don't happen. Uh, you know, the failure to for this country to secure its border on the, in the channel, the complete incompetence in, in dealing with that issue. I think what the public want is, is, is some competence. So whatever you think of the markets, whatever you think the argument is on that, you know, it's on trust and quarting. They didn't have the credibility to, to persuade people they were going to pay any of this money back. And, uh, you know, I, I think you have to take these things seriously. The best way to be independent, either personally or as a state, is not to owe, uh, particularly foreign institutions, billions and billions of pounds. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I think one of the things that concerns me about the spooking the markets narrative, which has been a fairly dominant narrative over the past couple of weeks, is that if we were at some point in the future to get um, a left-wing government or at least an ostensibly left-wing government and one which was proposing some fairly radical forms of intervention in economic life, there's every possibility that that would spook the markets or it would be described as doing so. And I'm concerned that once you've set that precedent where it says, well, politics must bow to the market, that even things we might want to do in a competent way, which would be a bit more radical and a bit more helpful for working people, could also potentially be weakened by the the idea that the markets take precedent. Yeah, no, I'm on your side on that. I think we need to be very, very vigilant about that. And in fact, 
if you know a little bit of economic history, you know, there is past form in this. I mean, mm. my um, SCP colleague, uh, Dr. Kevin Hickson at Liverpool University, has written a wonderful book on on Peter Shaw, but he also recently wrote, wrote a wonderful book on, on Jim Callaghan. And if you read that, um, the Treasury forecast that made Healy go to the IMF was bent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they sort of bumped him into it and, and, the, and they produced forecasts which sort of necessitated it. And a lot of people, and probably including Kevin and myself, think that uh, this, was, this was put upon. Uh, Healy and, and it was a sort of stitch up, and he didn't need to go. What they wanted was a, a turning point where they could effectively uh, introduce monetarism, and, and the rest is history. So no, you need to be completely vigilant about mm. that. But I, I debated the when we did our green paper last year, Brent, and offered um, Mark Littlewood and, uh, and and Christian Nimitz out and said, well, you know, I'll, I'll debate you on it, and I'll t- take you on, and they they were good faith enough to take me on, and and, and I debated them over an hour, and my my central point on neoliberalism and what they, the sort of economics they wanted and favored was i said you know my central case is what we have now you know exhibit a is how things are now and which are atrocious and you know, we need a different model you know this you know this rampant globalization of forgetting of the need to make anything the indifference to what is made where and by whom even if it's made by slaves this has got to stop um, but I totally take your point, Brennan. I think if we were a government, if the SDP were a government, we said, okay, utilities are coming back into state ownership, which is our policy, and, and railways. I, I totally agree. I think you'd have all hell on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, William, I, I really agree with you on Liz Trust not being very good. And at the moment, I find myself flitting between feeling sorry for her because I just can't imagine what it must be like to be under such an extraordinary amount of pressure six weeks into the most important job in the country to such an extent that she spent a long time kind of slightly hiding away. But then also thinking she's just not a very good politician. She's not good at what politicians need to be good at, which is speaking freely and interestingly and bringing people along with her and also doing things in a way that makes sense and which is convincing. And I thought the way that she and Kwarteng did their budget, it was very cack-handed, it wasn't very well thought through, and it didn't connect with people uh, at all, of course. Um, Do you think that speaks to a broader dearth of inspirational politicians is, is there a broader problem in for some reason in western society uh, across the board uh, and and particularly in the uk where we just don't have a high caliber of politician by the looks of things of course there are exceptions to the rule but in the top of politics at least it does seem that there's a lack of interesting figures a lack of inspiring figures very technocratic very robotic what do you think that problem speaks to I think you're right, and there has been a change. Uh, I, one of the things I, I ask people to do on this uh, about the, the, the quality of people getting involved in public life is to look at um, a photograph of Mrs. Thatcher's first cabinet in 1979. Whatever you think about their policies or their economics, and I, I fought them all for the whole of the 80s in the SDP uh, when I was a kid, whatever you think of that, you have to acknowledge that I would say about 10 or 12 of them would have been capable prime ministers you know you, you had a lot of depth of talent there um you know there are lots of theories about this i mean the, the sort of credentialization in politics means that there are more mps with degrees now that's true you had more trade unions you had more variety in the past i think it's a pity you don't have mm. those people in, in parliament but you know no i agree i think there's a you know major problem uh you know michael okershot once said that you know basically politics is the art of persuasion i think he's right yeah you know you you have to be able to make a case uh on the individuals you mentioned i mean i I don't want to sort of break uh protocol here but you know a couple of years ago at the spectator party i i met liz trust and she was rude to me Mm. uh and i just don't think it's very clever for people to be rude to people they don't know Mm. contrast that with um the day before kemi badenoch announced her candidacy. I, I met her at the same event, you know, and, and chatted to her for about 20 minutes, one-to-one. She was absolutely charming, intelligent, delightful. And again, policy aside, what on earth the Tory party was doing not mm-hmm. not voting for her, I don't know. But I think, you know, you have to believe it, you have to understand it. One of the interesting things, Brendan, I, I'm worried about this with trust, is that I think a lot of, if you listen to her, you know how on in debate you sort of on 
you know, to use a baseball analogy, you're on the first base, the second base, third, and then you get a home run if you're lucky. Trust on economics or anything else, you never get off first base. And I would literally point my finger at the BBC and a lot of the media and just failing to ask the next question. So she'll say, the way you get growth is by cutting taxes. And no one says, well, what are your sources of growth and how sustainable is it? What's your industrial policy? What are you talking about? Mm. I don't think she'd fall apart if you asked her that. I don't think Kemi Badenoch would actually. Yeah, I think Kemi Badenoch is a very good example of, of the exception to what appears to have become the rule because there clearly are still politicians who are driven, who do have principles, who are willing to put their neck on the line on certain issues. And I think Kemi Badenoch is a good example of that. And I think the broader problem there was just, just the institutional reluctance of the Conservative Party at various levels to take that kind of risk. And it would have been a risk because she's not as seasoned or experienced as as the other candidates were, but it, it might have been a, a risk that would be more interesting than what, than what we ended up with. Um, okay, speaking of politicians not really being up to scratch. I do want to ask you about the Labour Party and what's going on with the Labour Party, because at the moment they are obviously soaring in the polls. By all accounts, if there were an election tomorrow, they would have a stonking majority. Of course, we know that these things can change over time. And sometimes overnight, people often don't tell pollsters the whole truth about what they intend to do in the ballot box, of course. But they are Uh, rising a little bit in this steam and seemingly in public support, that's down to the troubles of the Tories more than it is down to Keir Starmer having transformed into a spectacularly inspiring politician, do you think? Yeah, that's that's probably true. I mean, the the SDP has the scars on its back uh, in relation to the two-party system. One of the, if you analyse it, one of the many a key feature of first past the post and the two party system is that the the poorer of the two parties, i.e. the one that's failing at any particular time, uh, is forgiven and is given time to repair itself. I mean, you know, this has happened many times, um, and they 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 just gradually recover, and mm. that's what's happened with Labour. I mean, I think actually Corbynista economics was a little bit more interesting than anything Starmer is saying, but. That's a separate point. I mean, uh, again, John Curtis, you know, has pointed out that you know, as a, as a matter of electoral law, mm-hmm. after any major crisis, you will be turfed out. That's so yeah. they're going to get they're going to get dumped. The Tories will get yeah. will get turfed out. And by the way, I'm I, I'm I'm not you know, I'm wanting to scare anyone, but the mortgage cri- the coming mortgage crisis. I mean, two hundred thousand people have their mortgage uh, rolled over per month. You know, they're going from f- fixed. Uh, rates to variable uh, getting bumped up from two percent to an off percent to five or six or seven percent. That is scary, and people won't be able to pay it. And so, you know, the, I think the Tories could be in for an absolute hammering. And what? So, what did Starmer have to do? He had to be competent. He just had to be boring. He's, I mean, <laughs> he just, you know, it is the old the old saying is that the oppositions don't win elections; governments lose them. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. With most providers like iTunes or Spotify, it's really easy to do with just one click. And if you get this show via YouTube, then make sure you not only subscribe to Spike's YouTube channel, but that you also click the bell so that you are alerted to every new episode. To be fair, he is quite good at being boring. So he's got that nailed. Um, I think, yeah, I'm increasingly of the opinion that the Tories need some time out of office. I mean, it's been far too long. Uh, They are in disarray and and running the country while also holding a party together is, is a very difficult juggling act. And I say this as someone who is incredibly critical of the Labour Party and has been for a long time, but the Tories need, I think they need some time out, they need some space out, and they need to uh, get their act together and, and work out what they're about and who they're for. Um, and, and on that question, isn't one of the problems with both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party is that both of them are actually you know, pretty fragile coalitions masquerading as parties or self-identifying as parties, to use modern parlance. Uh, You know, in the Tory party, you have a weird mix of people who are free marketeers and then on the other side, people who are a bit more socially conservative and 
not rampant marketeers, and then others in the in the Conservative Party who are more interested in cultural issues and appealing to people's sense of fairness and common sense and and not going down the route of woke ideology. So there's a real mix of different camps in the Conservative Party. And of course, as everyone knows from the past few years, the Labour Party is a fragile coalition too of different sections of the middle classes, one which is fairly radical and woke, and the other of which is fairly technocratic and pro-European Union, and also the old working classes, some of whom still vote for Labour, but probably aren't entirely sure why they do. Uh, Both parties are coalitions, really, aren't they? And, And wouldn't one of the solutions to the problem we're talking about to be a bit more honesty in politics and a bit more questioning within the parties themselves about who they truly represent and what they're truly for? Yeah, I totally agree. I think they they are massive, massive coalitions. Mm. I mean, a broad observation I'd make is that I think there are far, far too many liberals in, in in key positions. So uh, the poor old voter going into a, a polling booth in Leeds is, in a general election usually is faced by the prospect of a green liberal, a, you know, an orange, a yellow one, a blue one, a red one. There's not that much difference. And I think the lack of uh, PR, you know, the lack of uh, a different system stops people from voting honestly, and it yeah. also means that the Commons is full of credentialised people that go went to the same university, say, say you know, have the same opinions about everything, and you know, so it's it's very very frustrating. I don't, I think the only solution is is voting reform. What I'm hoping is that the uh, 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 you know a consolation of the coming crisis that we're in or the crisis we're in we're going to get will be a change to the system. It's interesting. My central prediction, literally three months ago, would have been that because of the electoral dynamics, the le- the Tories would would probably hold the balance of power or just about win next time. I thought, you know, I mean, you know, Labour lost Scotland, and it's it's extremely difficult under norm- normal circumstances to win a, an election outright. And my my sort of hope was that you might have a situation where the Labour Party broke away from this first past the post duopoly stitch up um, and 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 backed pr now interestingly last year at the party at the labor party conference the constituency labor parties what voted for pr and, and actually didn't hold but this year it did i mean this year the labor party conference voted for pr and you've got figures like andy burnham saying we want pr uh, and quite a few others so it's sort of happening but the problem brendan is that if if they think they can win and if it's winner takes all, they they, they don't want it. But I, I think it's yeah. urgently needed because I just don't think you're going to get honest voting unless it happens. I'm not a you know an absolute P- PR purist. I think you know the, the I mean I'm, I strongly support it, but I, I don't think you should be under, under any illusions that it's that it doesn't have downsides as well. But the first past the post certainly has a lot of downsides. The, the principal one is that uh, you know, votes don't match uh, seats very well. And uh, you end up with a parliament that doesn't reflect public opinion. Yeah, I, I'm in the exact same boat. I'm not uh, fanatical about PR and, and not even particularly excited about it. But it does seem to me to be quite necessary as as an important electoral reform because parliament uh, politics more broadly is just not representative of how people vote, vote. And we've had situations over the past few years where parties have received millions of votes and only ended up with one seat particularly yeah. that was particularly the case for UKIP and of course you know labor and the tories will remain as pretty chaotic coalitions so long as we have this first past the post system whereas pr i think would open the door to a bit more political honesty and a bit more political choice and and clearer forms of political representation which i think is very important um couple more questions for you william uh, firstly uh, I want to ask you about the cultural temperature of the country, because I think the fact that we're currently all talking about the economic crisis and the energy crisis, which are incredibly important, um, has slightly taken away from some of the cultural divisions that exist between the people who run the country and the people who live in the country, which I do still think are quite important. Um, So it's not only the case that people in Westminster are pretty inept at representing people's economic needs or meeting people's economic needs. They're also not very good at understanding why 
working class communities in a particular in particular think in a certain way and hold certain values and and don't go along with some of the more eccentric ideologies coming out of the universities and so on that's still important isn't it especially in relation to the labor party which even if it were to win in the next election which seems fairly likely at the moment they would still be quite cut off from ordinary people at the level of culture and the level of values Oh, I agree. I agree. I think totally cut off and totally um, estranged, actually, from, mm. from mainstream opinion. And let's not forget, it is mainstream opinion. I always make the point, you know, a party like the SDP isn't asking for very much. We are a mainstream party in that we, we represent what most people think, probably about 60% of the public. Um, so, no, I, I think that's vitally, it's very important. Uh, I, I think it just doesn't go away. Mm. I think the sad thing is that the... 50% of people that say in the polls they're going to vote Labour or have to vote Labour, it's desperately thin. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally a sort of cry for help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, 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 these people aren't saying we're really very, very convinced by Starmer. And Starmer himself, um, I don't want to be cruel, but basically that guy has been, he's been all over the place. I mean, yeah. he's um, he obviously was on the wrong side of Brexit in the vote, didn't respect the vote, actively campaigned to o overturn it, you know, his views on, on monarchy, you know, it's perfectly respectable to be a Republican, but then he goes, he's a Republican, then he takes a knighthood. And, you know, he um, a particular thing that irritates me about him and that type of politics that he represents is that he actually became leader of the Labour Party because he said he would uh, honour the sort of bread and butter left issues, you know, nationalisation. Mm. Now he's running away from that. And so the poor old voter gets this sort of soft Blair rehash to vote for. And it's a pretty, pretty lousy offer. But yeah, I know the cultural thing remains. We had a conference in Manchester, mm -hmm. you know, a few days ago and John Cleese headlined. It was quite interesting to get him along and listen to him. But in my speech, I, I, I was trying to get people to realize that a lot of our economic challenges, a lot of our economic problems actually are downstream of cultural issues. Aren't, they really are. Yeah. I mean, you know, if the lights go out this this winter, Brendan, um, it'll be because it, it'll not just be because we didn't build any nuclear power stations. It's really because we didn't want to. Yeah, that's the cultural rot at yeah. the heart of the system. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly important point, and the fact that w one of the cultural values that I think is a divisive one is the intense environmentalist outlook or eco. It, it, quite eco extreme outlook of many people in positions of influence um and the view of ordinary people which is that actually we just need more cheap and abundant energy sources mm -hmm. ideally domestically produced we need higher wages we need good working conditions we need to focus on uh, uh maintaining and improving the infrastructure of the nation rather than shutting everything down slowing everything down stopping oil and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that that's a very good example of, of where a, a cultural program or a cultural idea has had a palpably negative impact on the economy and on how people live and, and what their expectations are um yeah. so william my final question for you is on the sdp so you mentioned i was going to mention that you you had this conference uh, John Cleese headlined it. We, you also had Joanna Williams from Spite speaking. Um, our, our friend Rod Little spoke too. Uh, what what next for the SDP? I know you've had some local successes recently, which is wonderful. Uh, there is, I think, a growing interest in the party or a growing interest in a party that can do something a bit more different, a bit more honest and a bit more principled than what we're currently getting from Westminster. So where do you think, where do you see things going for you guys next in this era of crisis and flux? Well, we, we're just going to continue doing what we're doing. Um, we, at no stage along the resurgence, if we ever got smaller, we just get bigger and bigger every month, every, you know, every quarter, every year, conferences get bigger. Uh, uh, you know, and we, it was a big thing winning in Leeds because these are big city council seats, Brendan. This is 32,000 people now have a fantastic SDP councillor, you know, who, who actually left the Labour Party, who's born and bred there, uh, you know, and is, is, is absolutely superb. So I think my prediction is we just take more of them. We just take more, more seats like that. And we didn't just win it. We won by a landslide. We got more votes than anyone, all the other parties put together. But I've never, I've always been honest about 
the, the the reality. I mean, you know, this is this is just a, a, a very very long haul, and you have to build it. You, you know, I think we've had en- we have enough think tanks, we have enough groups and campaign groups. You need a political party. You've got to you've got to hurt these people in the ballot box. You really have. There's no there's no alternative than to have a political entity that you can vote for that uh, aligns with your values. So. I, I don't want to be boring, <laughs> but actually, you know, the Labour Committee from its inception in, in 1900, 1901, it took 24 years for them to be in power. The post-war Liberal Party, rebuilt largely by Joe Grimman, took 20 years to get back up. The Ecology Party, which became the Green Party, did 20, 20-odd 20 years. You could do the same. I think we're going to be quicker than that, but I, honestly, you know, next election we hope to have, we'll be in three figures for candidates we want to, I mean, I think, you know, coming sixth is a reasonable, I think probably reform are, are probably too big for us to beat, and that's fine. I quite get on with them. I have a very different economic view to them, but mm-hmm. they, they probably will beat us. But, you know, Brennan, if we come sixth if, of full spectrum national parties, I'll, I'll be very pleased, and I think we'll do it. William, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.